There is also a great culture diversity in Bhutan. Uh, but I think the culture as a whole has been instrumental in understanding, in shaping the biodiversity ethics. Why? It's because the culture is Buddhist or Hindu and there is a especially in Buddhism and in pre-Buddhism beliefs, there is a huge respect for nature and that all the all things in nature are living, living, so you cannot hurt them. And to give you an example, in Bhutan very often, you see a road going through, taking a turn and avoiding a big rock. Why? Because a rock is a habitat of the local deity and you should not cut the rock. So this is very important traditionally in Bhutan. You had forests which were the abode of local deities. You had uh, peaks, you know, uh, climbing mountain is not allowed in Bhutan for religious reasons. For So there is a huge respect in a way of the environment. And then Buddhism, which respect all living beings and all. So this has been incorporated in the issue of environment preservation very easily and really taken easily by the Bhutanese. So that is, which are great at managing their own resource in a traditional context. So this has been one of the strongest influence of culture in the ethics of biodiversity. One thing I found very uh, interesting in Bhutan compared to the West in general is that in the West we tend to keep religion or beliefs, let's say beliefs, uh, to the very private sphere of the family or an institution, and but it's not in the landscape. And in the Himalayas, and in Bhutan in particular, where the landscape, the landscape is full of reference to beliefs. You cannot escape beliefs when you walk or when you drive in Bhutan. And this is one strong point of the culture. The culture is infused in the in the landscape, or the landscape is infused by the culture. And the rituals are not only for the human beings, the rituals which are performed, which you have an extremely wide variety, and even after 30 years I still discover rituals. The rituals are not confined for human beings. The rituals are for human beings, but also the environment. Because if the human beings are happy, the gods are happy. Again, interdependence. And when I say gods, it's all the local deities. And if you anger a local deity by doing something which is polluting, the word Dri in Tibetan and in Zonka, uh, you will get immediately, or one month later, a retribution in a negative way, which means it's very important, for example, if you go to the pasture after it's been locked for the winter because the deity don't want people to go up to the pasture in winter, you will have a retribution the next year. The pasture will not be as good as the year before because the deity has been angry. But at the same time, this is fantastic in environment management. So the culture has really infused all this environment. And it's not only you when you are doing a ritual, you are doing it also for to placate or to please the local deities. Playing archery, which is a very strong point of the culture in Bhutan. It's a male-oriented culture.
in that way. Archery is very male feature. But at the same time, it is to please the local deities. And if the local deities are pleased with your shout, with your, en with your uh, enjoyment at playing archery, they will bring a good harvest. That's why most of the local rituals include archery. The 2008 constitution in Bhutan, which is the first constitution of Bhutan, was really a, a watershed in terms of secularization of the state and in terms of religious beliefs. Because the constitution said now, before Buddhism was the state religion, now the constitution says that the king is a protector of all religion and all religions have to be respected. This, of course, uh, created a lot of uneasiness among what we call the monk body. The monk body is a state state sponsor or, uh, organization which gather uh, as under its umbrella all the monks from the Drukpa clergy which are at the base of the state. The state was created in the 17th century by religious people of the Tukpa Kagyupa school, religious school, which became the monk body and which ran the country for two and a half centuries. So it has a huge historical importance. And the constitution also say that Buddhism gave its culture and its uh, features to the Bhutanese state, which is absolutely true. But it has become much more inclusive now. So the monk body plays a very important role nowadays in terms of spiritual healing and spiritual help for the country as an institution. It does all the great state rituals uh, and it has a very strong influence on the way people think. But at the same time, and this is a very interesting point, again, which shows how complex is Bhutan, is that in order to secularize more the country, the religious people are not allowed to vote in the elections because there was a fear that they would be too influential in the result of the elections. So they are not allowed to vote. And there are some critics right now who are saying that it is not a human right. They are deprived of their basic human rights. Because human rights are well known in Bhutan now, and we have, ILCS has translated the Declar Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Zonka, which is, I think, an achievement. And people always talk about their human rights right now, in the last five years. And so the, there is a discussion going on. Will, in the next election, which will take place in five years, will this clause in the Constitution be changed or not? And they are very vocal advocate of the changes that the monks and the religious people should be allowed to vote. So that shows the complexity of the issue of Bhutan with all its tradition and its religious past in the modern world. Languages in Bhutan is a complex issue. It's a fascinating issue and every, the Bhutanese are linguists. That's why I do not understand why in the West people have problems even with two languages. Many people in Bhutan, say 90% of the population, speak, I don't say write or read, because some are not, are not written, but speak fluently three to five languages, including people in the countryside, people who are doing menial tasks in the government, Everybody is a multilingual. It's absolutely awesome. I mean, I have no, no other word for that. So why do they speak so many languages? First of all, 
they speak their mother tongue, which is neither Dzongka, which is a national language, or English, which is the official language. Both Dzongka and English are uh, compulsory in schools. They are the languages of in education. And it means that a kid, which is six years old, arrive in a primary school in a remote area of Bhutan and start learning two alphabet, two way of thinking, and two totally unrelated languages, which he doesn't speak or she doesn't speak at home. And at home, what do they speak? To call it a mother tongue is again a gender bias because the mother might be speaking a language, the father might be speaking another language, and they might communicate in a third language together. That's why I'm amazed at the linguistic capacity of the, of the Bhutanese, absolutely amazing. So English and Zonka, the kids arrive in school and they are faced, some of them of course speak Zonka as their first language, but say 20% of the population only. And Zonka, why Zonka was chosen as a national language, is because they felt they needed to have their own language in the 60s. Uh, and they created a written language. The Zonka was spoken, but not written. And they created this language, which would become, Zonka means the language of the Zong, the language of the state. And it is related to Tibetan. It's quite different from Tibetan, but it is related to Tibetan. And they use the same script as Tibetan, but they wanted to have a different identity than Tibetan for obvious reason. So at the same time, in the 60s, many people spoke Hindi. And there was a big decision. Do, you, do we take Hindi? as a other language, or do we take English? And the third king decided for English because of international uh, openings. And he was encouraged in that, of course, by the famous Canadian priest, Jesuit, which was behind the education, modern education move, Father Mackey. So English became the official language of Bhutan, and that's why you find people speaking good English even in remote areas. And people speak 19 languages of, on such a small, in such a small country, people, there are 19 languages, including Nepali, which is widely spoken because they consider it very easily to, to learn, easy to learn, and this is basically the commercial language. Uh, so Hindi, Hindi and Nepali are widely spoken in the south, and everybody speaks a smattering of Nepali. So when people come to Bhutan, I say, you can speak Nepali, and people love to speak Nepali, because somehow Nepali has, in Bhutan, has a lightness feeling to it. Nepali is a language of happy, easy songs, movie. So it's a, it's a language which is associated with very different things than the traditional Bhutanese uh, features. So people love to speak Nepali. And many of Nepalese who come to Bhutan are surprised how easy they can, I mean, they can speak Nepali so easily. Also in Bhutan, because uh, Origin, Nepalese origin population came mostly from Darjeeling and Sikkim. The Nepalese is slightly different from the Kathmandu Valley uh, spoken Nepalese.